Behind the Scenes. Conversations with European researchers and innovators. I arrived at wanting to become an architect at quite an early age. Before wanting to be an architect, I wanted to be a chef. This, I think, was driven through experiences with uh, my mother, who was always cooking. In this podcast, we'll hear the inspiring stories and journeys of Europe's most brilliant scientists and innovators whose discoveries are having an impact on our daily lives. Here's how they got to where they are. These are our top stories. Our guest today is Phil Ayres, architect, researcher and educator. Currently, he is Associate Professor at the Royal Danish Academy at the School of Architecture within the Research Centre for Information Technology and Architecture. He's working on the project Fungal Architectures, an EU-funded project under Horizon 2020. And we ask the question, is fungi the future of environmentally sustainable building materials? Phil Ayres, thank you for being with us today from Copenhagen. We're going to talk about the future of architecture, the future of our buildings, which we can see more as a living entity. It's a fascinating topic and we would like to understand it through your personal journey. So let's start by talking about architecture in general. What does architecture mean to you? How did you describe it and how did you come to this field? Well, thanks for the question. Architecture for me as a discipline is a means to give form and spatial organization to our environment. It serves to satisfy particular needs, but beyond that, beyond the utility aspect, it also serves to inspire. It's the possibility of embodying ideas, even embodying ethics and values. And in good architecture, they might reflect the ethics and values of the time, In visionary architecture, that might actually anticipate and suggest new kinds of ethics and values and identities. This is what architecture as a discipline is for me. When you were very young, did you look around and see beauty in buildings and see maybe where they could be improved? Was this something that you always thought of? I arrived at wanting to become an architect at quite an early age. Before wanting to be an architect, I wanted to be a chef. This, I think, was driven through experiences with uh, my mother, who was always cooking. She's French. The cuisine that we had when I was growing up in Croydon in London seemed to be much more exotic than perhaps what I was getting as school meals. And I I was really fascinated by the idea of being able to translate instructions through recipes into uh, experiential products. And then through associations with some friends of ours that were in the building trade, We often found ourselves on building sites, and I I could see a similar thing operating here. There were plans out on the walls, and you could see things being constructed around you. And this was really interesting to me, this idea of translating instructions into made objects. So very, very quickly, I think by about the age of 10, I decided that I wanted to become an architect. Fantastic. So you're both an architect and currently a teacher, but do you consider yourself a researcher or a scientist in the strictest sense? Well, I I suppose when I started my architectural education, uh, I had an eye towards moving into conventional practice. But through my education, which was more creative-based rather than scientific-based, I was fortunate enough when I'd finished my postgraduate that my tutor at the time, Professor Stephen Gage, actually had a a research project underway. And he invited me to act as a researcher on that and also to teach in the master's program that I had graduated from. And this seemed to be a, a really great opportunity. It got me close to making rather than representing. It allowed me to continue working with the kinds of broad and deep questions that we'd been investigating in our education. And this is how I I kind of landed into a, a world of teaching and research. So it sounds almost philosophical in the way you talk about it. I wouldn't necessarily say philosophical. I think it was more about finding the right environment for being able to maintain a exploratory and deep questioning of a practice. Some of the things that we were doing, for example, in our education were about exploring architecture across time. 
they were also looking at the idea of not using computation as a way of making representations of buildings, but actually embedding computation into the fabric of our spaces, starting to think about architectures as time-based, as adaptive. And this really was eye-opening to me. Well, it certainly does sound, when I, I look at the current project, sounds like you're very free in thinking and, and even questioning the very materials that we're building out of. Um, So currently you're working as a principal investigator for fungal architectures. And I should say, of course, that's an EU funded future and emerging technology project. But it sounds extremely original. It sounds fascinating. Tell us a bit more about it in simple terms. Sure. So the project is really looking at the idea of developing a fungal based material that can act as both a structural and computational material, keeping it alive. Uh, so that we can essentially grow architecture. And it's a project that has a consortium of four partners. So ourselves as architects, we have the Unconventional Computing Laboratory from the UK. We have mycologists from the University of Utrecht. And we also have an industry partner from Italy called Mogu. That's, it's not just building houses out of mushrooms, I take it. Give us, give us a bit more of the, the kind of technology being used. Essentially, it's, it's not actually the mushroom. The mushroom we know as being the fruit of a fungal organism. What we're actually working with is the mycelium, the vegetative network of the fungus. And these kinds of technologies and materials are actually being developed in industry and are commercially available already. What you have is we're encouraging the mycelium to grow through a feedstock or what we call a substrate. And this creates a composite material. And of course, the properties of that material can be variegated based on the kinds of fungus that you're using, or the kinds of feedstock or the kinds of environment that you're growing it in. So this really is the basis of a kind of new material that we're considering for our project. Okay, now, Obviously, um, one of the big questions we ask around building and building cities is about how environmentally friendly it is, in particular internationally, of course, but in particular in Europe, we think about the Green Deal. So can you tell us about that and what is the impact of your work in that area? Sure. I'll take to answering that in terms of um, some of the issues I think that we have in terms of the construction industry. Currently, we have a projected demand for building stock. Bill Gates talks about this in his open letter in 2019. Essentially, to cope with the demand from population growth, we need to double our building stock. And that equates to essentially building a New York City every month for the next 40 years. So this is an incredibly huge demand. On top of that, we have issues of resource scarcity. So we're running out of basic resources that currently feed conventional construction methods. We're running out of resources such as sand. On top of that, the methods and materials that we're using are contributing to negative environmental impact. So although cement itself is not necessarily a particularly high impact material, just the sheer quantities in which we're using it makes it a primary contributor to CO2. So this really sets some of the challenges that we have in our built environment and really sets the scene for the necessity for finding viable alternatives, material alternatives, for being able to construct the built environment. Not necessarily, I mean, I'm not trying to set out a kind of modernist argument that these new materials will do away with concrete. The point here is more about being able to relieve the burden and thinking more intelligently and having a broader palette of possibilities for being able to address the scale of demands that we have. Do you think it's going to be hard to get the general public to accept these kind of building materials? Do you get a, a strange reaction when you mention them to people for the first time? I mean, maybe you could tell us what they look like in, in practice. There is a real issue about trying to get social acceptance for these kinds of materials. And I I think to immediately propose to people that they will live in a fungal house in its entirety might be a bit shocking. 
But this this is where our partners at Mogu, I think, doing some really fantastic initial work by producing components that you bring into existing buildings. So they're producing fungal flooring, fungal-based acoustic panels. And I think this starts to pave the way for more radical approaches. And on, on top of that, I think society is really living in a, in a fungal zeitgeist at the moment. There seems to be fungus everywhere in terms of products, but also in terms of scientific imagination. We see fungal mycelium even appearing in, in the episodes of Star Trek. I, I've been told. It, it does, absolutely. I was going to mention that myself because that's the first place I'd heard of mycelium was uh, is the latest Star Trek. So, I mean, how important is public acceptance in terms of realising the potential benefits? Well, I think it's absolutely vital to have public acceptance. But uh, I, I think, you know, the, the way in which we build that is also perhaps to show and demonstrate some of the amazing possibilities and advances that these kinds of materials and subsequently architectures might actually offer. Uh, the idea that you might be able to make your own intelligent living architecture simply by growing it yourself could start to open up completely new opportunities that make things more socially acceptable. And how important has been getting the support of, of EU funding been? Well, I mean, the FET funding is absolutely critical to being able to pursue these kinds of ideas. I mean, it's it's really fantastic that there are these funding instruments available for doing this kind of high risk, potentially disruptive work that really offers an opportunity to move from science fiction into science fact. of last questions what advice would you give your younger self i suppose to seek out at an earlier stage in my career working with radically different disciplines this is the second project i've been involved in with fet and it's been wonderful to actually have deep conversations with incredibly diverse disciplines such as zoology robotics computer science, disciplines that sit outside of the kind of normal ones that we would collaborate with within the built environment. And I think this is really incredibly important because trying to collaborate with these disciplines is essential in trying to deal with some of the pressing issues that we have in the 21st century. The issues, the challenges that we have simply cannot be dealt with. I mean, particularly, I, I would say, in the built environment. These are not issues that we can deal with exclusively from disciplines that are conventionally located within the built environment. And what's really interesting is seeing that these disciplines are really seeing the built environment as a space of innovation. Well, we are trying to have a, a thread through disciplines as well in these podcasts by asking subsequent guests to ask questions of each other. So we asked Alexandra Walczak, our first guest, who is a physicist working on the immune system in the context of COVID, to put a question to you. So her first question was very, uh, very practical. It was, uh, won't it smell bad? This is interesting. We've been doing a lot of work with these fermentations and growing these mycelium composites. It's really interesting that the kind of olfactory sense is really essential in determining whether you have contamination or not. And when you have contamination, you get a completely different smell profile. And when you don't, things actually smell really quite nice. You know, it's a bit like walking in a slightly damp forest in the autumn. And her second, well, her more serious real question, um, I suppose she's thinking with her scientist head on. She asked, how do you control the different types of fungi and the different types of bacterial communities? Because they're living and they have a life of their own and they can form communities that you don't expect. So she's curious as to how you control that. Well, in the lab, when we're actually making these materials, we're doing so in a sterile environment. We're also sterilizing the feedstocks or these substrates. And then in sterile conditions, we introduce our pure mycelium. That will then colonize the substrate. When we want to grow it in molds to make components, 
we will take it out, we will try and operate as sterile as possible. But of course, you're always open to the possibility of some contamination. But the key thing here is to make sure that essentially the fungus that you want to have colonizing your substrate is the dominant one. And by having dominance, it tends to ward off other invaders. Okay. Um, the same then for you. Our next guest in this series will be Demos Dimarogonis, and he works on robotics and automated control systems. What would be your question for him? One, one question is, well, what do you see as um, expanded roles for robots in society? Okay, that's a big one. <laughs> it's something we'll be wrestling with for some time, I think. And then the other question is, actually to do with the kind of implication that certain robot designs might have for architectural surfaces and also architectural spatial arrangements. It would seem that uh, these robots moving around need to have certain kinds of environment. I'm wondering what the architectural implications are. Well, absolutely. Thank you very much for joining us today. And of course, more information on your project can also be found online. Check the details of this episode for all the links and more information. Thank you for joining us today. These behind the scenes conversations with Europe's most brilliant scientists and innovators give you an insight into how the EU's investments in research and innovation impact our daily lives. podcast series is brought to you by the European Commission and you can find it on all listening platforms. If you enjoyed this conversation, rate this podcast on all listening platforms and share it with your friends on social media.